You're here because you want to master halogen derivatives with a University of Cambridge graduate. Let's begin. Halogen derivatives is a very bulky chapter that consists of not just one, but two different mechanisms for its reactions, along with different reagents and conditions as well. And it consists of a lot of different intricacies that you need to take note of behind all of its reactions as well. And I'll just be breaking this down very fast and quick for you in this video. So the two main halogen derivatives that we need to know are your halogenyl alkanes. So for example, this one over here, which is one chloropropane. And another example is halogenyl arenes, which is your benzene rings that are directly attached to your halogens. How do we prepare these different halogen derivatives? Well, we've actually covered a few in the previous lectures as well. For example, you can use FRS on your alkanes and get your halogenyl alkanes. Do refer to my alkane lecture to understand the mechanism and the reagents and conditions behind this reaction. You can also do electrophilic addition of alkenes. Now do refer to my alkene lecture as well to know the mechanism for electrophilic addition as well as the reagent and conditions to add your halogens to the alkenes. Now on to something new which is the nucleophilic substitution of alcohols. So my alcohols, which are generally ROH, can become RX under these few different reagents and conditions. One, I can use dry HX, so either dry HCl or HBr or HI, and heat. And you should memorize the side products of this reaction as well, and how to balance them. Another reagent and condition we can use is px3. So if I use anhydrous px3 and I heat it, so either pcl3 or pbr3 or pi3, then I can get my rx as well. Think of it as just the OH being replaced entirely with the halogen. And then you can also use for chlorine specifically anhydrous pcl5 at room temperature and pressure. And I would get pocl3 as a side product and hcl as a side product. And lastly, you can also use anhydrous SOCl2 and heat. And therefore, you would get RCl with SO2 as a byproduct and HCl. Do take note that the alternative name for SOCl2 is called thionyl chloride. A key observation from these last two reactions is because the side product is HCl, you actually get white fumes of HCl that turn your damp blue limus paper red. You can also do electrophilic substitution of your arenes in order to get your halogenyl arenes. So do refer to my arenes lecture to understand the reaction mechanism and the reagents and conditions behind this reaction as well. So what goes behind the nucleophilic substitution reactions of your halogenyl alkanes? Well, as it is a substitution reaction involving a nucleophile, hence the name nucleophilic substitution, it will involve a nucleophile and involve the halogenyl alkane. So there are two main mechanisms behind your nucleophilic substitution. One of it is called SN2. Now SN2 involves a rear attack by my nucleophile and it's going to attack the carbon from behind the halogen itself. And the electrons from this lone pair of the nucleophile is going to attack the carbon and simultaneously the bond, the CX bond, the bond is going to get broken as well. So you would actually get a transition state, which is found in the middle over here, that shows in 3D how that the nucleophile is attacking from the rear end and the CL on the other end. And I draw these two dashed lines because this shows that the bonds are half broken and this shows that these are the critical bonds in the transition state. Do take note of this transition state sign as you'll be needing to draw these as well. And if required, you also need to put a charge for the whole state. And then the final product, you would get the nucleophile actually on the opposite end of the halogen with Everything, push, everything else pushed backwards. Now one thing to take note is that for SN2 reactions, 
you will actually get inversion of your stereochemistry. So for example, if I have one configuration, let's say the R configuration for my reactant, after SN2, I will get the S configuration. The same thing is if, if I start with a plus configuration and I end with a minus configuration as well. Because of this inversion of stereochemistry, you actually would not form a racemic mixture and you only form one of the enantiomers. Another thing to take note, in relation to reaction kinetics, you have to know that this rate equation is where rate equals to K, which is the rate constant, concentration of Rx times the concentration of the nucleophile. And you use these two concentrations because both the Rx and the nucleophile are involved in the critical step of this reaction. Well, it's just one step reaction, that's why. So you have to also take note that this reaction is highly and highly more favorable if there's lesser steric hindrance. So you must look at the steric hindrance about the carbon that's getting attacked. If there's more steric hindrance, it's harder for the nucleophile to attack from the rear side, and therefore the reaction would not be preferred. Now what's going to happen if this reaction is not preferred? Then we look at an alternative, which is SN1. So what's happening for your SN1 mechanism is that the CX bond is going to get broken first. The electrons in the CX bond is just going to go to X. So in this case, for example, it will go to chlorine. And this is because of the electronegativity difference over here, which is a key thing to draw, by the way. And then this is a slow step. So just take note of that. And you'll form your carbocation and Cl minus. And then for your second step, the nucleophile is going to attack with its lone pair onto the carbocation. And because the nucleophile is generally has a partial negative charge or negative charge, this is a very fast reaction because it's reacting with a carbocation, and you will form your product. The rate equation for this mechanism is just rate equals to Krx and this is because only Rx is involved in the critical slow step of this reaction. Now do take note that because this is a two-step reaction, this means my energy profile for this reaction will have two humps because there will be an intermediate phase of this reaction, which is this one, and you must also know that the first hump, because the first step is the slow step, the first hump is going to have a higher activation energy than the second hump. Now do also take note that we have to look at the stability of the carbocation to determine if this SN1 mechanism is favored. And this is really easy to know because actually your carbocation is involved as an intermediate. And this kind of follows the same principle as your electrophilic addition mechanism. Now, if there are more electrodonating R groups attached to the carbocation. That means your carbocation is more stable and the reaction is preferred. So this generally means that your tertiary carbocations that is formed will be more preferred than the primary carbocations. So if you look at a carbocation and you see it's tertiary, this means the SN1 mechanism is generally more preferred. Also note, if the carbocation turns into a chiral carbon, for example, in this case over here, this means the reaction can form a racemic mixture. For example, if you take a look at this, the carbocation in this case is trigonal planar. In other words, it's in the same plane, all the bonds are in the same plane as one another. And then your nucleophile, let's say this is your nucleophile, you can either attack the carbon, which is in the middle, attack the carbon from the top of the plane, or attack the carbon from the bottom of the plane. And because the nucleophile has a equally likely chance to attack from the top and the bottom, you will actually get two different products, which are enantiomers. And because there's a 50-50 chance of producing this enantiomers, we call this mixture a racemic mixture. Now for the properties of a racemic mixture, just refer back to my Introduction to Organic Chemistry lecture to understand how a racemic mixture behaves, especially with plain polarized light. Now how does my reactivity of my halogenal alkanes vary for the nucleophilic substitution? Well, we gotta look at the size of the halogen. If the size is greater, because we go down the group, for example with iodine compared to chlorine, 
The valence orbital used is larger and more diffused, and you can see that the bond length is higher. Because the orbital overlap between X and the carbon atom is less effective, and because of that, the bond strength would be lower as we go down the group. So the CI bond is actually weaker than the CBR bond, is weaker than the CCR bond, is weaker than CF. And because of this lower bond strength, if, if it has a lower bond strength, it means that the lo there's lower activation energy for the reaction, and therefore the reactivity is higher. Do take note also that the CF bond is generally too strong and therefore very unreactive. Therefore, for your halogen derivatives, we don't really use CF or we don't really talk about fluorine. Now, what are some other reactions of your halogenyl alkanes? You can also form your alcohol from this reaction. So the reagents and conditions are NaOH aqueous or KOH aqueous and heat. You can also form nitriles, which is a very key reaction, by the way. And this is using KCN or NaCN in ethanol and you heat. Now, why this is a very important reaction is because this is the only step up reaction you need to know. A step up reaction is a reaction that gives more carbon to the main chain. And why this is very useful is because sometimes we need a way to add a carbon to the main chain through a reaction, and this is just a very convenient way to do so. From there, when you have your nitriles, your nitriles can also undergo a few reactions. For example, it can undergo hydrolysis. So it can do acidic hydrolysis, so that's the top, where you use HCl or H2SO4 aqueous and heat, and there you can get a carboxylic acid with an extra carbon, and you can also have basic hydrolysis, which works the same way, but instead we get the carboxylate anion, and we do this under NaOH aqueous or KOH aqueous and heat. Your nitriles can also be reduced, so from CN, you can get your amines. So I can either use LiAlH4 in dry ether, which is a very common reducing agent, or I can use H2 with nickel or palladium or platinum catalyst at room temperature and pressure. Another way to form your amine via nucleophilic substitution is through excess NH3 in ethanol and to heat it in a very sealed tube. And therefore, your NH3 can just substitute your X and you can create an amine without a step-up reaction. So just take note that from this reaction in particular, multi-substituted products are possible. This is usually the case when you use a nucleophile that involves nitrogen. And what this nitrogen does is because with this lone pair, it can attack and it can substitute one of its hydrogens out with R group and then go so on and so forth because it keeps having this lone pair until there's no more hydrogens to be substituted. So do refer to this example to understand this better. And lastly, for your allogeno alkanes, you can also undergo elimination. Do refer to my alkenes lecture to understand the reagents and conditions behind this as well. Now we move on to halogeno arenes. Now for halogeno arenes, it's quite different from halogeno alkanes because it can actually not undergo your nucleophilic substitution. Now you have to memorize, but more importantly, understand the reasonings behind the no nucleophilic substitution reactions for halogenyl arenes. Now this is mainly because of two factors. One, your CX bond is strengthened. Now if you take a look at this diagram, your halogens that are directly bonded to the arene have a p orbital that can align or overlap with the p orbitals of the arene. Because of that, it can actually donate the lone pair, which is in the p orbital, into the pi electron cloud. When it contributes to this pi electron cloud, you can get this partial double bond character involved in the CX bond. And because of that, you can think of your CX bond as a one and a half bond. And therefore, it is stronger than a normal single bond. Now another factor that you have to consider is steric hindrance. Remember that the nucleophile has to approach the carbon first before you can get any reaction. Now, because the benzene ring is very bulky and actually very negatively charged because of the pi electron cloud, it's gonna repel the nucleophile away. 
and this will hinder your SN2 reaction. And the carbon is just not accessible to the nucleophilic attack by the rear side. Therefore, your halogenyl arenes tend to not undergo nucleophilic substitution. So what reactions can halogenyl arenes go through? Well, you can refer to my arenes lecture because the benzene ring is still very reactive and can undergo reactions such as electrophilic substitution. And do take note that halogens are deactivating groups. Because they are electron withdrawing, they are very electronegative. So it will actually take electrons away from the benzene ring. Because of this, your electrophilic substitution usually happens at a very low rate and therefore you will need stronger conditions. So for example, if I were to do nitration, for example, I would use some temperature greater than 55 degrees Celsius. Now on to some distinguishing tests for halogenyl alkanes. For this test, it's special because you have to memorize these reagents and conditions and it goes by several steps. So a way is to first use NaOH aqueous and heat. This way you can substitute the halogen out and get the X minus ion. Next, you want to use excess dilute HNO3 after cooling so that you can remove your excess OH- in the reaction. So this way, in step 3, when you're adding silver nitrate, you won't get silver oxide. And instead, you would observe for PPT because this PPT is actually the AGX precipitate. Now, you can also use NGNO3 in ethanol and heat. And these are the main distinguishing tests for your halogenyl alkanes. Now, what does this specifically tell us? The expected observation is that if it was a chlorine, like a chloroalkane, then you would expect a white PPT because AGCl is formed. If it was RBR, you expect a cream PPT because AGBR is formed. And for iodine, you expect a yellow PPT for AGI is formed. You can also look at the rate of PPT formation because this is very dependent on the strength of your CX bond as I covered just now. So for example, your CCL bond is going to have a tougher time to break than the CBR bond and then, then the CI bond. And therefore the rate of PPT formation is at the lowest for silver chloride. And then it gets faster for CBR and the fastest is CI. Lastly, it's important to understand what are CFCs. CFC stands for chlorofluorocarbons. And these are generally very harmful for the atmosphere because under UV light, your CCL bond can be broken to form your chlorine radical. And just like what I covered in the alkanes chapter for free radical substitution, this chlorine radical is very reactive and it's going to react with ozone, O3. And we know that radicals can undergo chain propagating reactions. Therefore, it is very destructive to the ozone layer. So instead, we use substitutes like hydrocarbons, hydrofluorocarbons or fluorocarbons because these only have CF bonds. And as I also covered just now, your CF bonds are too strong to be broken very easily. And therefore, they can resist any form of breakage and your fluorine radicals wouldn't be formed. So that's all for halogen derivatives. This chapter, I find that it has a lot of relation to the other organic chapters that we have covered, like your alkanes, your alkenes, your arenes. Therefore, it's very important to go and revise your previous chapters as well, to know the reactions that form your halogen derivatives and the reactions that involve your halogen or arenes. Next, you would also want to memorize the reagents and conditions for halogen or alkanes and also you want to memorize the reaction mechanisms both SN1, SSN and SN2 for your halogen derivatives. So if you like this content, be sure to hit the subscribe button so that you can get more frequent updates from this channel. And if you want to enroll in my online class, be sure to hit the link below so that you can book a free call with me and I can run through your past papers and go through any doubts and clarifications you have and show you why my class is the best fit for you. I'll see you in the next lesson.